Hello! One of the best things about the 16-bit computer era for me was the music. But have you ever wondered how that superb music you heard in those old games was created? Or how they managed to fit sometimes quite long tunes into such a small amount of space? Well, sure, today we have compression like MP3. But even with those tools you can't fit a 5 minute track into a few kilobytes and still have it sounding great. So how did they do this? Well, let me introduce the tracker. So let's start with some history. It's a little bit more complicated than I expected. Prior to the Amiga, on the PC, music was limited to PC speaker beeps. Sure, it was possible to reprogram the PC speaker to actually play proper sounds, but it was very CPU intensive and sounded terrible anyway. The Apple Mac of the era was also fairly limited. Systems like the MSX, 128ZX Spectrum, and the Atari ST included a special synthesizer chip, originally made by General Instrument and later resold by Yamaha as the YM2149. The Commodore 64, however, featured the well-known SID chip, and I'm sure many of you remember some excellent music coming from that machine, created by some very famous names in the industry. In 1985, a program called Sound Monitor appeared, which helped writing music for the SID. Rather than having to code the music manually into the song, the song could be input into this application. These kinds of sounds and music were the norm. That was until the Amiga came along. In July 1985, the Amiga 1000 appeared. And unlike other computers of the era, the Amiga was different. Tucked away inside the heart of the Amiga was an array of custom chips. One of them, dubbed Paula, was responsible, among other things, for four independent sound channels of 8-bit PCM, not synthesised, and it could play these directly via DMA, meaning that no CPU time was required. Paula was originally called Portia, which was short for ports and audio. At the time, there wasn't really any other system that could play sound like this, and it would be a few years later before products like the Sound Blaster would finally arrive on the PC. As you'd expect with the release of such a powerful machine, applications like Deluxe Music Construction Set and Aegis Sonics started to appear, providing ways to edit music and play music, both using traditional notation. Whilst both capable of creating music, they weren't really doing anything different from the previous systems. And in some cases, unless you could read sheet music, they weren't very useful. Adding music to games at this point was still mainly a case of coding them directly into the program. But with so many more options available, this was starting to become very tedious. So in 1987, when Karsten Abarski, having a successful background in music on the C64, was asked to create some music for an Amiga game called Amigus, he created the music on his own musical package that was set to shape the future of the Amiga music scene. And that program was called the Ultimate Sound Tracker. The application was a bit like a next generation version of Sound Monitor, and whilst not constrained by the limits of the C64, Karsten was able to use real PCM audio rather than synthesised SID sounds, of which he included a second disc full of digitised instruments. The program would let you utilise the Amiga's sound channel to script the music in a much more visual way, and he assigned the four channels as melody, accompaniment, bass and percussion. Don't worry about all those crazy numbers at the bottom, we'll explore that later. Released via EAS as a commercial product, which included a small amount of source code to allow you to play these songs in your own program, the product did not do very well at all. Unfortunately for Karsten, the Ultimate Sound Tracker was met with very poor reviews, citing it as illogical, difficult and temperamental to use. But there were some people that saw the potential in his creation. The demo scene, an art form that sprung up and often involved competitions to present short demos showcasing the talents of developers, by often pushing machines way beyond what anyone believed they could do. This highly competitive arena however had a darker cousin. The competitiveness also led to a race to crack the latest game, and these crack games often included a fancy intro, or crack tro. This crack tro would be used for messages, for the group to announce that it had successfully managed to crack the game first, and not only tiny in size, but they were often very visually impressive too. As you can see here, two different cracks for the same game. Most crack tros, however, have one thing in common. Music. By reverse engineering the original Sound Tracker program, a developer calling himself Exterminator, part of Jungle Command, released an unofficial version of the Ultimate Sound Tracker that he dubbed Sound Tracker 2. Along with its source code, this included several bug fixes and visual enhancements over the original, and now that the cat was out of the bag, 
different groups started to compete to update the previous version and improve upon it. Within a short period of time, Soundtracker had become quite different from the original. With each iteration, slowly new features crept in and the application became more and more user friendly. Unknown of Doc, or Dr. Mabuse Orgasm Crackings, huh, don't ask, released several versions throughout 1988, and somewhere along these versions, a major change occurred. Previously, to load a song, you also needed to have the second disc full of the instruments of the song. This meant distributing your song was a little more complex. A feature was added that allowed the ability to save the song as a module, which included all of the instruments as part of the file, meaning you didn't need the instruments disc anymore to load it back in again. This meant sharing your musical creations much, much easier. Now at Doc's Soundtracker 2.0, the program had matured greatly and started to resemble some of the more modern trackers. Whilst researching this, it appeared that Soundtracker 2.2 was the latest official release by Unknown of Doc. However, with Soundtracker 2.3, there was another big change. Soundtracker 2.3 had support for 31 instruments, and to help identify these larger modules, a special 4-byte tag was added to the mod file, the m.k. More on that later. Behind the scenes, however, Carlston was still developing the Ultimate Soundtracker, and released a version 1.8, and then a version 2.0, but sadly for Carlston, was pretty much forgotten. Now this is far from where the story ends, because in the late 1989, two Swedish programmers, under the pseudonyms Mahoney and Cactus, released Noise Tracker. The big difference with this though, however, was it was so much easier to use and full of keyboard controls. But there's a puzzle to be had here. I'm not sure whether Soundtracker 2.3 or Noise Tracker extended the number of instruments to 31 first. And the reason comes from that strange m.k. marker. It was believed for a long time that that stood for Mahoney and Cactus, the creators of Noise Tracker, but actually, it might stand for Michael Kleps. That's the real name of Unknown of Doc, and therefore it's believed to be his initials. Anyway, back to the story. That's not where it ends, and around this time, a competing format arrived. MED, which wasn't that much different from Noise Tracker to start with. However, when version 2.0 came out after it had been rewritten, it included native MIDI support and would continue to develop to become one of the most powerful music editing packages on the Amiga. Octomed could support more than four audio channels but at the cost of increased CPU usage. This generally meant that Octomed modules didn't end up being used in games so much. However, our focus is not on Octomed, and that would need an entire video just by itself, so let's get back to and continue with the Soundtracker saga. Progress didn't stop on the Soundtracker front, however. A new tracker appeared, ProTracker. Whilst initially looking a lot like its predecessors, it was much improved, and things were in for a big change. Beginning with version 3, ProTracker really started to set itself apart from the previous generation of trackers by featuring a higher resolution display and numerous editing options. The user interface was also a lot cleaner, partly owing to all of the extra screen real estate. With the right library installed, this version could even compress your modules using PowerPacker, and also had the ability to save your modules as a standalone executable. ProTracker is the version I remember, after receiving it on an Amiga format cover disc many years ago. In fact, Here's the cover disc that came with the issue, and it still works! So I still haven't answered one of my original questions, which is how are these files so small when seemingly they play for hours? Let's take a look into how they work. The secret to their size is their construction. A piece of music would be created by breaking it down into groups of lines called a pattern. Each pattern contains 64 lines, and on each line, you could play up to four sounds at once, directly corresponding to the number of Amiga sound channels. By creating these patterns, and then choosing the sequence to play them in, often reusing the same pattern several times, a full song can be created. Along with the sounds, you can also apply various effects and control playback, such as portmento, volume and modulation. More on this later. So here's an old game I remember playing with an awesome soundtrack, Cybernetics The First Battle. For those of you that have also played it, I'm sure you'll agree this is an absolutely fantastic piece of music. So let's take a look at it inside ProTracker. Firstly, it's only 55 kilobytes in size, and I know the entire file will happily play for well over 3 minutes. So the song has a length of 38 sequence positions. This means there are 38 patterns that will play before it restarts. But this doesn't mean 38 different patterns of music, as some of them will be repeated. This song actually only has 19 different patterns, and it will reuse and repeat them in different sequences to make the song longer. 
Inside of each pattern, we have the four channels that can play independently. You can have a maximum of 31 instruments, but by being able to play them at different frequencies or notes, you can play a tune. Looking towards the bottom of the screen, you can see a load of scrolling numbers. Let's see if we can make some sense of those. Well, the first two digits is the line number. Then, each of the four columns work the same. The first two are the note to play, followed by the octave. The next two are the sound sample or instrument number to use. The next three are a little more complex, and it's what gives these mod files so much power. The first is an effect number, and the remaining two are a parameter to use with that effect. Generally, all the numbers are written in hex notation in mod files, so you'll have to get used to counting to F. So what commands have we got available then? Some effects can be re-triggered without actually replaying the sound, and that depends on the effect. Well, let's start at the beginning. Effect number zero is arpeggio. This causes a chord effect, where you can choose that it plays the current note, and then rapidly switches to two other notes that are a specified number of semitones away from the original. And here's an example. Effect number one is very straightforward, a pitch slide up. Followed by effect number two, a pitch slide down. Effect number three allows you to combine the first two by sliding to a specific note. Effect number four is vibrato, which has the effect of wobbling the note's frequency up and down. Effect number five joins two effects together. It allows you to continue sliding to a note whilst adjusting the volume. Effect number six works in much the same way, this time combining vibrato with volume slide. Effect number seven is tremolo, which basically changes the volume of the sound rapidly. Effect number eight on the Amiga is not used. On other systems, it can be used to set the pan between left and right. Effect nine's an interesting one, set sample offset. This allows you to trigger a sample, but instead of starting at the beginning, you can choose where it starts from, and it creates some very interesting effects. Effect 10 is volume slide, either up or down. Effect number 11 doesn't alter the sound playing, it changes the playback sequence instead. It makes the pattern immediately stop and then jump to a new position. Effect number 12 sets the volume for the channel. Effect number 13 is pattern break, which means it stops the current pattern and then starts the next one at the line specified. Now I'm going to skip effect 14, or E, for now, because there's a lot more complexity there, so we'll move on to effect number 15, set speed. Set speed changed its format over the years. Any number specified less than or equal to 32 changes the number of ticks per division. Anything greater than that is treated as beats per minute. I'm just going to let this module play for a minute because it's a very good example of setting beats per minute. Now onto the extended effects. All of these are effect number 14, or E. E0 allows you to control the Amiga's high pass filter. This also has the effect of controlling the power LED on the Amiga. Effect number E1 is much like effect number one, fine pitch slide. Effect number E2 is the same, but in the other direction. Effect number three controls what it calls glissando. When doing a pitch slide, this controls whether the pitch slide is smooth or steps at semitones. Effect number E4, well, I'm skipping this one as I couldn't get it to work. It's supposed to let you control the waveform used by vibrato between sine wave, sawtooth wave and square waves. Effect number E5 controls fine tune by overriding what the sample has.
E6 is Pattern Loop, and it allows you to create short little loops within a single pattern. E7, as like E4, I'm skipping because I couldn't get that one to work either. It uses the same waveform patterns but applies it to the tremolo effect instead. E8 isn't used. E9 allows you to re-trigger a sample very shortly after you play it. E10 or EA is Fine Volume Slide Up. And its counterpart, EB, Fine Volume Slide Down. EC is Cut Sample and it allows you to stop a sound abruptly. ED delays paying a sample for a specific number of ticks. And likewise, EE will delay a pattern for a specific number of ticks. Finally, EF. This one's a weird one and rumoured not to be implemented in ProTracker, although it was seeming to have some sort of effect. It's supposed to allow you to invert the loop in a sound sample, but I couldn't get it to work right. So with all those effects at your disposal, you have an enormous amount of control over the playback of the sound. And it's no wonder that people were able to create some of those most amazing pieces of music that we all liked. Moving on from all these crazy effects, how is the music actually stored? Well, the actual mod file format is surprisingly simple. So let's take a look. The file starts with 20 characters for the name of the song. And after that, there's 31 blocks, or 15 on the original Ultimate Sound Tracker, of sample header information, which contains the name of the sample, its length, fine tuning information, volume and looping information. After the sample headers, we have the length of the song, i.e. the maximum number of positions stored. The next byte is mostly unused and has some special uses as noise tracker. Following that is 128 bytes, and each one contains the number of the pattern to play. This is your play sequence. And lastly, there's four bytes used to help identify the file. And for a standard Pro Tracker module, this is set to m.k. After this part of the module is read, the program would then scan for the highest pattern number. Then it would proceed to load that many patterns from the file. Each pattern is 1024 bytes in size, and it's broken down like this. Each pattern is 64 lines long. That means each row in the pattern is 16 bytes long. Each row has four sound channels, meaning each sound channel must use four bytes. The four bytes, however, are packed in a special way to get the most out of them. There's room for 8 bits for the sample number, 12 bits for the note period, 4 bits for the effect number, and another 8 bits for the parameters of the effect. So the smallest possible Pro Tracker module is 2K, but that wouldn't make any sound. Immediately after the patterns is the 8 bit PCM audio sounds for each sample, and then that's it. File loaded. But the tracker revolution didn't stop there. Other systems soon started to have their own tracker clones, each with their own unique set of features. For example, Scream Tracker. Impulse Tracker and Fast Tracker on the PC came with its own formats, and many more audio channels. Later, we even got Optimed Sound Studio for Windows, and applications like Renoise, OpenMPT, Mad Tracker, Winamp, Bizarre Player, and even VLC will play them. With Optimed, in more recent years, there's been a fair amount of success in the charts. For example, DJ Aphrodite used two Amiga 1200s running Octomed to create some of his early hits. And then there's Calvin Harris, who used Octomed to produce his first album, I Created Disco. I doubt Carsten was even aware of the revolution he was going to start when he created the Ultimate Sound Tracker. And for those in the know, which now includes all of you, he's somewhat of a legend, with some of his own music being remixed even up to this day. Well that's my experience with the wonderful world of trackers. If I look through my old collection of floppy disks from the Amiga days, I have a whole selection with just mod files on them. I used to have them playing whilst working on something, as I'm sure many of you did. I tried my hand at making my own music back in the day, but let's just say I think I was better off coding. Like everything, the tracker has evolved, but there's so much good music out there still to be listened to, from places like Aminet with over 20,000 files, and then there's the mod archive, which literally has hundreds of thousands of files. Whilst for most people the origins of the tracker have been mostly forgotten, the impact of Carsten's design will probably last for as long as music is being created. And on that note, I hope you've enjoyed this musical journey with me. Thanks for watching, and keep on tracking!